I'm interviewing someone I went to high school with? What? Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Dupree, scouring the globe to bring you stories of courage, passion, and resilience. If I could sum up this podcast into one word, I would use empathy. Now let's get inspired. Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I am your host, Brett Dupree. Today I am with interview with Ryan Sawyer, someone I knew from high school. Basically, I said that, which is different than all the other times I did my podcast, is because I actually got people to review my podcast. As I mentioned many times, I am a Toastmaster. And one, if you are a Toastmaster, if you're not, there's just something called Pathways, Level 4 and Pathways. One of the electives was to do a podcast. So I played 15 minutes of my podcast and people actually reviewed and gave me evaluations. One of the evaluations were like, maybe you should talk about what you were going to talk about at the beginning of it. Others were something along the line of be a little bit more focused and have more content have your content at the beginning to be more structured but i don't want structure here and there that part is deliberate i want this part to be a free form of my thoughts i a lot of times will have a basic idea of what i want to talk about but at the same time you're getting me authentic me because that is the point of the joyous expansion podcast authenticity those are my favorite parts in the interviews when people are talking about their authentic self i really want to mirror that at the beginning where I freeform. One of the interesting developments since my last podcast was, well, this interview for one, as this is the first interview I've done since I believe August, which has been a really long time. This, um, that last episode was supposed to come out in September. I just let life get in the way and I could see some rust on my end, but at the same time while doing it, I noticed how fun it was. I love doing those interviews. They're super fun. It is fun talking to someone, learning what made them tick, and really listening to what they're going through or what they've gone through. As I was talking to someone about this podcast, where I was telling them the point is to talk to more normal people. And what I mean by normal people, I'm not talking, I'm talking more along the lines of people you'll probably meet in your daily life or that you have met in your daily life or yourself. Because a lot of the times... Those are the stories, in my opinion, are just as impactful. The internet's full of inspiration porn. Not that it's bad. I just can't think of a better word for it, where you see somebody with, like, huge harrowing stories of people who have don't have their arms and legs, but they still paint. Somebody, I remember listening to one story about, from one of the world champions of public speaking, where he talked about how he was from Africa And they used to just get like a piece of chicken for Christmas. And the piece was really small and he would save it and eat it throughout the week, which is not hygienic. But that's how special chicken was. And when he came to the United States with only $12 in his pocket, the first thing he did was buy underwear for the first time. And the second thing he did was to buy an eight piece bucket of chicken from KFC and ate the whole thing until he got sick. And while that was an amazing story, listening to how, what he went through in Africa, to how he came here and how he changed his life, when it comes to relating, I found it inspiring, but not relatable. I've lived a decently blessed life. Yes, I have been poor. I almost became homeless to, well, kind of homeless two years ago. My parents went to a food bank a couple of times. I lived with my grandparents for I think about six months so my parents could catch up. My mom joined the army so she could have a steady paycheck. My parents got divorced. You know, I've been through things. I've been through some hardships. But for the most part, none of them have been... No one's going to make a movie based off what I've been through because it's not super kaboom. Oh my God, this guy was... I was never trapped in a cave for or a canyon for 127 hours and had to chop my arm off. I'm sure that guy would be a great person to interview. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, well, it's the stories of people who went through similar things of me, like listening to Ryan and what he went through, the person in my interview. Number one, number one, I knew him. 
in high school. And I never would have imagined he was somebody like that who went, had anxieties, who had depression. Because when I had anxieties, when I was in high school, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one. And that's one of the beautiful things about this internet thing we have, is we get to learn that we're not the only one out there and that our problems are valid. One of my favorite things I've heard in my life is that pain is like a gas. Gas fills the container. So it doesn't matter if it's a lot of pain or a little bit of pain, it fills the container. Meaning that if your pain can be so tragic, like you got cancer, your father committed suicide, your mother tried to murder you, and you lost your left leg, and your children have disowned you, that pain is valid. It's well, very valid, as I just kept on trying to think of all the worst thing that happens to you. Or you just got laid off and you don't know what you're going to do next week. Both of those are tragic to the person that is happening to. And to disparage or look down upon the person whose pain is small is, in my opinion, damaging. Yes, I would love to have an amazing story. I think the postpartum depression, the lady was amazing that blew my mind but i also find that thing that's very relatable and those are i would love to have somebody who had a very harrowing story a cancer survivor honestly i'm also looking for a sex worker i really want to interview a sex worker because i'm very interested in their thought processes because i never asked one i never had a conversation with one so if you know of a sex worker who wants to do a podcast i would love to re- see how their life is and yeah share their story But anyway, sharing stories of people who have just gone through their lives and trying to live the best they can, I think is special. And that's why I love my podcast. That's why I love doing this. And I want to focus on that more. I started taking therapy because my day job that I have has great insurance. I want to stop this up and down cycle that I'm in. I feel like for the last 10 years, pretty much since I started Joy's Expansion on LinkedIn 10 years ago, as I keep on getting congratulations on your work anniversaries for my Joyous Expansion Life Coaching. And part of me is like, I'm not as successful as I want to be or at all. I want to be consistent. I want to stop this thing where I do well, where I get excited about something and everything goes great. And then I don't get the results I want and things aren't going very well. And I'm not making the money I would like to make. And then I stop. And then I kind of recharge, I guess. Or as my therapist says, air is let out of the tire. And then I spend like six months reinflating the tire until I'm excited again. And then I restart. And then I do that for roughly about 10 years now. And I want to be consistent. And one of the ways I I decided I want to be consistent, and actually one of the ways my therapist talked about, was to find the joy in what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. If I would pay someone to be on my podcast and interview them, or if I would pay to do this, which I am, $20 a month is what I'm paying for Zencaster, which I'm barely using. Use it for the first time. So in a way I am paying for my podcast. Yeah. But the idea is to remember how fun it is to interview people and share it out there and think that there maybe there's one person that's helping but if nobody listens i'm listening and i'm being inspired i'm having a good job this is the podcast i want to do this is the podcast i want to listen to and i love it i love doing it and paying attention more to that when i'm editing and editing can be a slog editing my i edit the interviews because and my talking number one i want to get rid of all breathing i don't really want to hear me breathe over and over again and also i want to get rid of ums and ahs because of my toastmaster background and that can be time consuming i tell people it takes about three times as much time as to edit than it is to actually do that well three times the audio so like today's interview was 40 minutes so it took me roughly three hours to edit all that And that can just feel draining and, oh my gosh, I can't wait to be done. But at the same time, I should be focusing on why I'm editing. Number one, I want the best sounding podcast I can get. Number two, it makes my interviewee sound their best so they can convey their message. And when I want them to listen to it, if they listen to it, I want them to feel proud of themselves. As one person I shared talked to me how they said, know what I mean over and over again and she didn't like how many times she said that and I felt bad because I felt that I failed my idea was I wanted them to sound natural so to leave some of the verbal crutches in 
Now I eliminate almost all of them. The only ones I don't are the ones that are would take more work or they have a sound if I try to get rid of it. It's because I don't want this to take forever and I'm not the biggest skilled editor in the world. And I want the person to listen to it and sound amazing and be super proud of themselves. And if I do feel that overwhelmed, to start editing in smaller chunks and not try to do it all at once. Just try to do it over the three days of, if I interview Sunday, edit Monday, Tuesday, and today, which is Wednesday, so I can get it out there. And just remember that. Because when you're going for a goal, when you're going for something you want in life, when you're really trying to live your dreams, if you get too tied to the results, which I had to learn over and over and over again, which is why I am getting a therapist so I have someone to talk to about this so that I can get the support that I need to continue and keep on going and to have that reflection upon me, especially to call me out when I am slipping. But to remember the why and the purpose and living your truth rather than living the results Consistent action does not guarantee results, but the only way to get results is to act consistently. And if you keep on going, keep on going, being consistent, you might be a five to 10 year overnight success. But if you truly remember why you're doing it along the way, you will touch people. I've touched people. People have read my book and told me how much that helped them. People have heard my speeches and told me how much they helped them. People have listened to my podcast and told me how much that helped them. And to remember that, to remember that I'm creating something that can last, something that can reach people and maybe one day it'll take off. But what matters is it's helping me and potentially helping other people as well. And you know how it can never help people if I don't do it. One of my favorite sayings when I talk to people, especially when I talk to people about writing a book is that the book you release is 100% better than the book you don't. So the podcast that I create, the podcast that I keep consistent, is 100% better than the podcast that I don't. And remember that. To remember that. I generally don't do this at the beginning, but I want you to think about what you want in your life. What you truly to desire. Think of the joy it brings you to do it. The joy it brings you to deliver it, to serve and hold on to that. Because in life, you will get knocked down. There's no hairy, fairy, woo, woo, law of attraction exercise that you can do to make sure nothing ever bad will happen to you and everything in life will be a success. There's no such thing as being in such a vibrational resonance that there's no roadblocks in your life. But what there is is there is a thought process and a way to focus your mind where the roadblocks become speed bumps. And that is the purpose of personal development. Speaking of self-development, ooh, do I have an interview for you today. I am talking to the Ryan Sawyer. The interesting thing about Ryan Sawyer is I went to high school with him, which is crazy. I, if you would have told me that I would have a podcast and that Ryan Sawyer would be my guest talking and we would be connecting on our shared anxieties in high school, I would have told you that you were crazy because there's no chance I'd be talking to people and what the heck is a podcast. And yet here it is. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> when I... In the future, I'm going to need to tell people to put this in the third person. All right. Ryan Sawyer, former national champion collegiate coach turned entrepreneur. Ryan left his coaching career to be an involved and present father as well as as well as secretly battling his lifelong depression and anxiety. The depression and anxiety got so bad, he couldn't continue to coach and knew it was time to invest more into self-care. He has been on a relentless personal development journey, lost 70 pounds, found a connection to God slash universal energy. He owns a residential painting company. He's a professional auctioneer, as well as a Q-Effect coach. Now is the time to listen to my interview with my high school buddy, Ryan Sawyer. Hello, Ryan Sawyer, and welcome to my podcast. Well, hello, Brett Dupree. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen you, man. Since our, I think, 10-year reunion. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. Did you not go to the 20-year? I did not. No? I was very, very broke at that time. 
Gotcha. No, it's, it's been a long time. It's good to hear your voice, Ben. How are you doing? I am doing great. It is a beautiful day to be alive. It always is. So it says here, you, you got into coaching? Into coaching. You mean talking about prior to my uh, football coaching career. Is that yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah. Talking so about. I was right out of college when I got done playing at Central in 99. I went straight into, into coaching there at Central. I did it for three years and then came back to it in 2007. Was that at Eastern? Our first year back was at Central again in 2007. I was running my painting company over in Seattle, and Bo Baldwin, who got the head coaching job there at Central, gave me a call and wanted to know if I wanted to get back into the game, and it took me all about five minutes to, to realize I could paint at any time. Go ahead and set it all down and move back to Ellensburg, and then I coached one year at Central with Bo, and then he got the head job at Eastern, and I spent eight years on staff with him at Eastern, so I was there from 2008 to 2008. 15, I guess it was. Yeah. That's really cool. I Part of me wants to bring that up because my dad graduated from Eastern Washington University. Oh, nice. Nice. Now it's a great school. I barely remember. I was five at the time he went there. So it seemed like a nice campus. I just remember a lot of concrete. So then were you born in Spokane over here then? I was born in Yakima. Okay. Okay. So it says on your bio that you had an issue with depression and anxiety. I, you know, it's something that I battled my whole life. I was diagnosed multiple times, diagnosed or suggested to, is how I like to put it. I don't like to call it a diagnosis. Of uh, being bipolar, I know I was very either high or low, right? I was very manic and very productive and going like a million miles an hour, or I was at a spot where I couldn't barely get out of bed. And, and I dealt with this ever as long as I can remember. And it wasn't until about 35 years old is when I finally started to kind of come to terms with it, that I'm depressed. That was one of the first times I could actually say it out loud, but I still kept it a secret and dealt with it secretly until it just got to a point where my anxiety attacks were so bad that I had to start communicating. My wife actually found me curled up in a ball in the corner of the room because I just was doing the dishes and just couldn't I just couldn't breathe. I started losing my vision and having one of those massive anxiety attacks. Once she found me, she I had to start communicating it. You know, she wanted to know what was going on and kind of led me on a path of recovery from that and, and separating myself from that anxiety and depression. So what does your depression look like, like through a daily basis type thing? You know, it's not something that I daily wake up anymore, but if you were to take it through a day of what I remember from it, even say a couple of years ago, it would be out of the gate waking up with this sense of lack from the very first breath, feeling like there was something wrong with me. There was something not only missing, but actually an existence of a demon or whatever you want to call it living within me that just made me feel less than, not enough, just pain, suffering to even just be in my body. I'm not sure where that originally originated from, but I know that I now am in a place where I can look back on that journey and I can look back on my life and I can see signs of it all the way back to when I was 12 or 13 years old. You know, even going through those high school years where things probably seemed from the outside looking in, and you, you know, we went to high school together, so you could probably voice to that, that I was suffering, but yet was found, became a master at distracting myself with things around me or things that I was good at, or eventually turned into drinking. I went 20, in my twenties, I went 10 years with barely sleeping. I mean, taking medication on depression, medication, all kinds of stuff. And looking back on it now, it's, it's been a lifelong thing. When you're in the moment, sometimes you either aren't willing to, or you can't see it for what it truly is. So if you can't see it for what it truly is, it's hard to bring light to it. Oh yeah, totally. The interesting part, yeah, I was about to think about that because thinking about it in high school, it wasn't so much, well, number one, I don't think we knew what depression was in high school. Mm. It was something that was on television for lifetime movie of the week type thing. Not sure. something real people had, but the Sawyer that I knew wasn't someone I would call depressed. Mm -hmm. He was, well, a freaking animal in the weight room. But basically, how did you go about trying to hide it from other people? Or how was the depression with dealing with other people? Yeah, I became a master at masking what I was feeling inside, right? So I think I always stuck to things 
that would make it so I wouldn't have to address it. So you talk about being an animal in the weight room. Okay. So I gravitated towards football in the weight room because this was a place that I could have a release. You know, I could get the day out. And I remember vividly when football was no longer, right, the last day you strapped it up, there was this this huge fear of how am I going to address my daily stuff that gets piled up? Because in the past, it's always been through this football or for, through training, through the weight room that I could go and I could have this huge release and let out this aggression and really quote unquote, express yourself, right? Even though that's probably creating bad neurological pathways within me or bad or is it just not healthy. So I always just kind of gravitated towards the people and in the environments and the situations that allowed for me to continue to mask it. And, and I think that's even one of the main reasons why I was so intrigued by going back into coaching, because here was a familiar, safe place where this version of myself, this intense irritable person was welcomed because that would make a really good defensive line coach or a really good strength coach or whatever I was in those years of my collegiate career. Oh, so in a way your coaching career helped uh, facilitate or enable your depression. I believe so. I believe that we're not aware of what it is that we're suffering from or that we're even suffering at all, that this is not normal. We don't have to feel this way about ourselves. Then we're not aware of that. We go about our life in an unconscious manner that we just seek out the things that fit our stuff, that doesn't hit this part of us that causes the suffering. So you then put yourself in this box or this way of living and the people around you in the environments, that just kind of keeps you safe. But the problem is as life goes on, this box gets smaller and smaller and smaller because your stuff gets hit from more and more ways. And, and sooner or later, you get to this place where you're living in this tiny little compartment. You can't get out. And this is when the anxiety and the depression really takes hold is because this is my experience anyway, is that then now I'm having a hard time walking down a flight of stairs without having any anxiety about the day, you know, and I'm having a hard time doing these things. But when I'm in the coaches meeting or I'm on the field with a whistle around my neck, this was the time when I didn't feel it because I was in this element that was safe, that was known to me, that I knew that I was good at. But the moment that I was in the unknown, such as a marriage or parenting or a new situation of some kind that ask something new of me, then it was you know nearly unbearable to be in my own skin. That's very interesting. The idea about anxiety, I know I went through anxiety a lot in high school, and my anxiety was more social anxiety with the idea of everyone around me, just nobody liked me. No matter how much someone would say they liked me, I'd be like, you're just saying that to get something. And it was just a constant, just constant, just being tired all the time from being, feeling like I'm being judged all the time from people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how your anxiety looked uh, from your eyes. Well, what I know about anxiety is that depression is going to be something that we're dwelling on from the past, some sort of past conditioning. And anxiety is coming from worrying about the outcome of some sort of future event or worried about something outside of us, such as what does somebody think of me? They don't like me in your case, or I'm not going to live up to the standards of what it means to be in my family, or I'm going to fail as a father, or I'm going to get to this point in my life and I'm going to look back and regret who I have been this whole time or whatever this anxiety comes from. It's looking outside yourself or ahead of yourself into a different time, a place, or a different person that causes thoughts to run that are not coherent, that are not the truth of you. And so then now, as you're trying to manipulate your outside world, to feel or to not feel a certain way, then the anxiety and what builds around that anxiety is able to grow. That's been my experience is, is, is look, me looking towards the future and the fact that it being unknown and the fact that I'm not living within my truth in this moment, I'm not living from a place of integrity. My thoughts, my words, and my actions are not aligning from my true essence. They are being ran from old patterns, from old programming, from old conditioning that I have just accepted as my truth. 
and created this mask that I view the world from and how I perceive what's happening, you know, around me and what's good. And then, so what, what does that mean about the world? And so all these anxieties come from that. So you're talking about before at the age of 35, it mm -hmm. sounds like that was a turning point for you. Yeah, no, it, it really wasn't. And a lot of that has to do with the children. Okay. So my son is six years old. I'm 41. So 35 years old is when I had my first born. And anybody who's a parent would be able to tell you that when you bring another soul into this world, that it changes things. And you start to look in the mirror a little bit differently and you start to put a little bit more meaning around things. And for me, the big turning point was I never, when I was in that world of coaching, I never thought for a moment that I was going to be doing anything else with my life. It was just, this is what I was. And even it was an agreement that I had with my wife when we're dating and when we're getting married, it's like, you're marrying me with the agreement that you're marrying a football coach. This is, we're going to potentially move every couple of years. We're not going to know what the next step's going to be. And that it's unpredictable and competitive and all these things. Leading up to having children, my mind was very fixed. And once I had a kid and went through that experience of seeing my boy born and felt that connection, I was like, uh-oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be home. I want to put my kids to bed. I want to be around. I don't care. I'll go dig ditches. I don't care what I do, but I I want to be home. I want to be present. I want to be I want to be a father fully. So how did that change things in the self-care personal development area? You said you don't want to be a coach, but that I'm assuming that wasn't enough to go, "Oh wait, I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not in coaching." Mm -hmm. Right. No, I the depression got worse and worse even after I left coaching. The, pre the depression continued to worsen up until just a couple of years ago. The self-development piece was I was still pretty heavy into my habits of drinking, gambling, doing those type of things, living life in the fast lane. And so I was 70 pounds heavier than I am in today in this moment. And when I got, when Heidi got pregnant, I, you know, obviously quickly determined that, okay, I'm going to need to be a healthier version of myself than I am now. All of these ways of masking my depression, drinking, gambling, football, all of these things that just always distracted me from my inner world and kept my inner world basically hidden, those things I started to remove. I started to be conscious about my spending. So I still didn't gamble as much because I wanted to have a good environment for the kids. And I sat down drinking and I started working, losing a bunch of weight and getting healthy because I wanted to be present. And obviously, eventually I left coaching because as I started to remove these distracting habits, ways of basically, you know, just buffering, then the inner world became a more apparent and became more painful. And then I had to start addressing it. Or my other option was go back to all the ways of distracting and become unconscious and not show up for the world the way that I desired to, not show up as a father the way that I wanted to and intended to. And so I had a choice. And the choice was to face my shadows head on. So talking to you, it sounds like a lot of your identity for a lot of your life, starting with high school and before that, was football and then being a coach. Mm -hmm. And that became part of who Ryan Sawyer is. And then mm -hmm. you decided to let that go. How was that moment of, was it like elation of a lit being brought off or gigantic fear of like, what the heck am I doing? Or just a combination of both? It was this, you know, are you a dark night of the soul, right? When you go through this transformation, you're going through this, this period of time where you're questioning who it is you are. It was painful. There are still moments where you're letting go of a version of yourself that has got you to this moment and it has worked for you. I had a fair amount of success, beautiful wife and a national championship ring and multiple, you know, other things like that within that world and coaching division one football, for God's sakes. I mean, it's a dream job in a lot of people's eyes, right? Like how could you potentially leave that? People didn't get it. People didn't understand my thought process with that. And, and there was a part of me that was always questioning as we're going through this transformation, knowing that we have to, because the only other option is not viable and it's, or trying to take some easy way out. It's not going to work. This period of time when we're transforming, where we actually have to surrender a part of ourselves and let it go and, and to make room for a new version of ourselves, to make room energetically, emotionally, even chemically, biologically, biologically, everything for a new version, an upgraded version, a higher expression, a better version of who it is we want to be, more in alignment 
with who we've come here to be and start to get in line with your integrity. And then you start to have moments. So there's moments where it's painful, Brett. And then there's moments where all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, like I've never felt more like me than I do in this moment and start connecting to a higher power and start doing these things as, oh, wait a minute, I haven't even lived. You know, I haven't truly fully experienced any one moment because I'm always living that moment from some sort of construct of the past or a perception of the future rather than just being present and allowing for things to unfold the way they are intended to. I think to answer your question, it's a double-sided coin. I think it's painful in one moment and glorious in the next. So how have you been handling it? What exactly have you been doing to facilitate this change? So a lot of yeah. it is present, so that sounds like meditation to me. So I'm curious to see what exactly you did. You sound you talk a lot about presence and awareness, which sounds like you did some meditation practices. So what exactly did you do to help you facilitate from a depressive state to a non-depressive state? If that's what you would call it, yeah, well, an elevated state anyway, for sure. Yeah. Going on about three years ago, two and a half years ago, something like that. I reached out to a friend of mine and my wife and I were in a spot where we were, our marriage was really at a crossroads and a lot of had happened up till that point, And I started to really realize that I need to ask for help. I need to find mentorship. And I reached out to a friend who was pretty heavy into Dr. Joe Dispenza's work and his meditation, all his practices and stuff. And I started reading his book, you know, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself and just dove into as much of that material as I possibly could. I started a daily meditation practice. I started doing Dr. Joe's stuff every single day. I did six months straight. I know for a fact that I went six months straight every single day without missing. That was my best run, right, of doing those type of, at least at the very minimum, I did his breath technique or one of his breathing techniques anyways, made that my foundation was going to be meditation, was going to be starting the day that way, was going to be connecting and reminding myself who it is I've come here to be. And really with the mentality to not get up from that meditation until I overcame myself until I transcended and became a different version of myself in that moment. And then a ton of practicing how to carry that with me throughout the day. And sometimes I'd make it till 11 o'clock in the morning before I got triggered and derailed. And sometimes it'd be one o'clock in the afternoon. And sometimes I could come all the way back home at four or five o'clock in the evening and feel like, hey, I'm still in this elevated state. I would incorporate spot drills throughout the day, meditations throughout the day and or in the evening to to try to get my body to a state like you talked about, a non-depressed state or a elevated state as joy, as peace, as love, as abundance, as these things and start to teach my body how it feels to feel love and to allow yourself to feel abundance and allow yourself to feel joy and to really just completely reprogram myself and my experience of how I was experiencing life to be from a positive manner. That sounds awesome. This a thought occurred. A lot of times when people are in relationships and someone goes through a drastic change, even positive, that can actually even, I've heard people's relationships even break up because of you becoming a different person. Right. So how did you bring your wife along on this journey with you? Wow, boy, how much time do we have, Brett? <laughs> because this is this is a fantastic question for where my wife and I are now. And I'll tell you where we are right now, and then I'll give you some context about how we got here. We just started Dr. Joe's online progressive workshop together last week, and she's diving into it. She's picking up her own meditative practice. And when I first started, and I first started going through all these changes, it was such an unknown place for both of us. It did nearly separate us. But I was at a place where I was in so much suffering that I had to do this for me. And that's where it started. And I told her, like, I have to go down. I'm going to go as far as I have to go, not to rid myself of this feeling of this experience of how I'm experiencing life. Because if I wake up tomorrow feeling the same way, I have suicidal thoughts and that's the truth. And so I have to do something. And I know that I don't want this to continue. So I'm going as far as I have to go. And, and that led us crisscrossing and back and forth and weaving and bobbing each other all over the place. And it wasn't until I realized my role in all of this was not just for me to transform for myself. 
because that's where it started, almost selfish, right? It was like, I have to rid myself of this. But then it turned into me realizing if I can do this, anybody can. And now it's my responsibility as a father, as a husband, to create an environment that is safe and that is welcoming for her to be on her own path and her own spiritual journey. And because of the turmoil that it caused, me going through this change in profession and transformation and everything else, we ended up coming back together and learning how to live these parallel lives where she's in this place of growth and transformation at her pace, in her way, what, how she connects with it. And so am I. But there was actually a moment in time where I actually sat down and I set down Dr. Joe's stuff. And I made an agreement with her. We're not going to like, let's say a week long meditation retreat with Dr. Joe. I'm not doing that alone without you. Because I was, I was at the point in time where I felt like if I were to go down that path and go that much further with it, that it would drive a wedge between us that would be hard to remove. And so now we're at a place where we're practicing it together. We're studying it together. I mean, I'm just beside myself excited because I get to pick it back up full steam ahead. Right. But yeah, there was definitely a lot of stress around that transformation, around becoming a new version of myself. She loves it now, but at the time, it was very uncomfortable. Do you find going through it this time with her, you're able to go even deeper because you're able to share that experience, that energy, and that enlightened state with somebody? Yeah, no question. There's the level of now I'm almost... You know, I'm a student of Dr. Joe, no question, but I'm almost teaching it at the same time. And this is this is what it all comes down to. We have experiences in our life, so we can turn around and share that experience with somebody else and help them transcend wherever they are in life. So that's the whole point, right? This is what you're doing with your podcast, with your book and your whole experience. It's how we all should be living is taking what we've learned that makes us a better person and teaching it to somebody else. So to just elevate the human consciousness, right? That's the whole journey we're on. Exactly, my friend. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, before we started talking, you said you're actually in the process of creating something with yeah. your wife. We are certified as Q Effect coaches. And the Q Effect is basically a way of looking at who it is we're being with what we're having. Some investigative work into our triggers and into really the pebbles, right? Think of our life as a river. And throughout our life, we're placing all these rocks and boulders and it starts to change how that river flows. We now have to flow around these things to keep ourselves in a good place or in a positive place. And if we hit a cup up against a rock, then it's uncomfortable and it causes suffering of some kind. And so we're taking on this Q effect, this Q process that allows for us to address daily triggers, internal triggers, external triggers to see what it is that the pebbles that are building up in our river over time that cause us to act the way we do, to be the way we are with what we're having and really is just stifling our growth and stifling our potential and keeping us from living the life that we truly abundantly deserve and to keep us from being in the present moment. So this is our foundation is the Q effect. And it's a, it's a science-based research driven process that takes you through a 21 day step, basically journaling exercises that is investigative. It goes inward and finds where it is that we made certain agreements with ourselves and who it is that we are, have come here to be. So in kind of closing that gap and with our coaching model, our experience of the Q process is that there are a couple of things. One is that we want to teach aspects of our journey that worked for us. So there'll be a phase one of this program that'll be, let's learn how to become in this present moment with what is happening around us and basically quiet the voice and be in this moment, be here now, right? The power of now. Untethered Soul, Michael Singer. These are some of my favorite books and authors. Eckhart Tolle, you know. And, and then the second phase will be this ability for us to go back and to investigate these triggers and do some healing process around these things. So we're liberating energy, right? We're letting go of aspects of ourselves that's keeping us from our truth from our true power and allowing our body to feel certain emotions and, and to kind of tread through the mud a little bit to come out cleaner on the other end in the sense of having more space to create from. So the second phase is really a healing phase. And then a third phase would be 
and rewriting the story, right? So that's part of that second phase is rewriting the story that you've told yourself. You're now in this moment more authentically you because you have been able to uncover these triggers that are keeping you sabotaged or keeping you limited. And then the third phase is now with this clean slate, now with this whiteboard clear from these triggers, there's now energy freed up. There's space to create from. Deciding who it is that you want to be, how you want to show up for the world and what the next obstacle is in your life or getting yourself on stage and speaking, whatever it is that you may want to draw into your life, becoming clear of what it is, who it is we need to be to obtain that goal, to have that experience, and then closing the gap between who it is we're being now and who it is we need to become to draw in that future self of ours that can obtain those intentions and goals. That sounds very exciting. It I'm is. sure you're going to help a lot of people with that. That's the goal. That Maybe is the even goal. couples, since you well, have a lot of experience about growing together and well, that's kind of the thing. We don't want to be, we don't want anybody to think that we're doing any sort of therapy for couples, like saying, Hey, Here's a couple's idea. Go out to have a date night once a week or anything like that, right? This is saying, okay, it takes us both growing to make it really work because it's a scary path to go down where one person is heavy into personal growth and the other person's maybe resistant to it. So we're saying this journey is more impactful and is easier to gain traction if it's done together individually. Individually, as in, I'm going to look at my stuff and my triggers and I'm going to do the work on me. You do. And this was the conversation we had in the kitchen when we were trying to decide whether or not to save our marriage. And you look at your stuff. You look in the mirror. I'm going to support you in your growth. I'm going to be here to create this safe environment. But I'm not telling you that you need to be different in any way, shape or form or do anything different for me to heal and to grow. I need to meet my own needs you meet your own needs, and now let's be on this parallel path together, supporting each other, having compassion for ourselves and, and each other. The program is more around awareness. Aw they call it awareity, not therapy, right? We're building our awareness. <laughs> and so we're building our awareness, and we're doing it together. We're creating an environment within the home that can can really gain traction. What that is 100% on point, Brett, is that we see ourselves doing this coaching program with couples because, hey, I, I'm going to relate to the men. She's going to relate to the women. We're doing this together. We, we're doing this because we want to create a better environment for our children, for our community. And we want to really just live a life where there's nothing and no one against us. But we're able to see our experience of life as it's for us. It's for us to learn something. It's for us to heal. It's for us to grow. And it's for us to overcome and become the next version of ourselves. And to do this as a couple, trust me, it's a lot more impactful and a lot more fun than it is when you're feeling like something out there is resisting you, you know? Mm, that sounds amazing and very impactful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's a, it's a good going to be coming out here in the next few months and talking about it like this makes me want to just dive right into it and start doing it right now because we're so passionate about it. I look forward to seeing it come into reality. That's right. It's coming. So we're coming towards the end of our interview time together. And the one thing I like to ask everyone to do is to give a one minute of motivation, something along the lines of if you had a time machine, you're able to go back to your eight-year-old self and you only had one minute to convey a message to that eight-year-old self or to just condense everything that you really want someone to get into one minute. Mm. Okay, one minute. Is it okay, Brett, if I go back and have a conversation with my say 30 year old self or 25 year old self. Oh yeah. All right, that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, one minute, let's go. First of all, let's determine the roles that you play in life. Father, husband, friend, etc. And then ask yourself the questions. Who am I being in these roles? Who would I be if I were the best version of myself? And what is the gap between who I'm being and the best version of myself? And then start to do the work on closing that gap. Constructing the best version of yourself in your mind. And most importantly, create the feeling as if you are that person now and get connected to that feeling. Take on this gap with incremental shifts, one incremental shift at a time, and incorporate rituals into your life that help you stay connected and remind you of who you've come here to be. Because the human operating system is built to forget. Be willing to address your shadows, let go and surrender the old self for the price of the new life, 
is the old one. And most importantly, have fun and celebrate every win along the way. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much, Ryan, for being on my podcast. It's been ex- extremely fun getting to know you as an adult all these years since back then I only knew you as a high school student because right. that's, where, that's where we knew each other. All right. At the same time, listening to your story of anxiety and depression, I am sure is going to help many people who listen to them as they can relate to what it is and to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel if they are willing to do the work and there is something that they can do. And I'm extremely excited for you and your wife to create that co-creation of life coaching together so that you too can help couples who, grow, you know, couples who grow together, stay together, or if they go apart, it will be like, well, we gave it our best shot. And it's time to grow apart because, you know, that's life. But basically being able to help people like that is very exciting. And I thank you and your wife for the work you're doing. And I am very excited and way to make this world a better place, my friend. Well, thank you for all the work you're doing, Brett. Uh, I love listening to what you have and watching you along the way. Hey, and I love I love your post today on, on Instagram, by the way. I wanted to mention The Rock, Have Self-Compassion. I posted it. I checked on my Instagram just before we hopped on this call, and I just had a chuckle. I was like, that's absolutely perfect for, to, for this conversation. So I just keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast, and maybe we'll cross paths again here soon. Eh, that would be awesome. Have a great one. All right, Brett. Take care. And there you have it, folks. That, my friends, was Ryan Sawyer, the guy I went to high school with. I really enjoyed that interview, mostly because he shared his struggles. I never thought he was depressed in high school. So it was interesting to hear that Ryan Sawyer had anxiety. Isn't that cray-cray? My favorite part of the interview, honestly, is when he said a werapi. I had to work really hard not to crack up during that part. I almost lost it. You ever got the giggles? In a little insider baseball, my girlfriend was in the room during that interview, and she was behind, and she also had a hard time not just cracking up at a werapi. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love listening to people's struggles, is what I was going to say. What a weird thing to say. But at the same time, it's interesting listening to somebody who went through something and then got over it. The interesting part to me about it was that a lot of it reminded me of David Data in the sense of going in relationships. At first, the first stage being something along the line of the he was in it for... 100% himself in both in both sides he was first in his career for himself as well as going through personal development for himself because he had to but then he worked on but then he realized if he wanted to keep his marriage he needed to go to second stage which meaning she has to go on her own path while he goes on his path but then With his Q-Effect coaching with his wife, that is a third stage where they are working together and serving each other and allowing themselves to grow. So it was actually a great example of the three stages that David Data talked about. One thing I really enjoy about what he is about to embark on is having the two perspectives of the personal development team. Not only that... Having the person who first goes through it and then the person who jumps on board a little later as probably a combination of seeing what it does for the partner as well as wanting to work on the marriage. So that perspective as well, I think, is really awesome. Not just the husband and wife dynamic, but the one person who started first and the other person who also decided to work on it through that second time. Through the, yeah, what it sounds like. He was like, I'm going through these changes. You can come with me and and have her to come along, which is amazing. I think that's pretty much how you have to do personal development with a significant other. You can't force anyone to change. You can't make someone change. Someone has to want to change on their own. But you can set the example as well as give tools to help, which is what it sounds like Ryan Sawyer did. It would be really interesting to hear from the wife's perspective. So if you are listening, wife of Ryan Sawyer, I believe your name is Heidi Sawyer. If I got that wrong, I apologize. 
But I would love to have you on my podcast to listen to your side of the story and your story, period, as I am sure you're going through your own struggles while Ryan was going through his. It'd be interesting to see how that dynamic worked. So cool. So I'm very excited for what Ryan has in his future. It is awesome to see somebody who goes through a struggle and then helps somebody through it. That is one of the secrets of life coaching, probably even therapy, is most people who go into this field is because they did something and what they gone through, they want to help other people through. And that's just the beautiful part about it. If you would like to work with Ryan Sawyer, as of right now, he does not have website, but he does have an Instagram. It's Ryan Sawyer 101, R-Y-A-N-S-A-W-E-R 101. I'm sure he'll put his Q process coaching in there. You can also search him on Facebook. Look for the person who looks like the picture that you looked at if you saw this podcast through a picture. And that's how you know you got the right Ryan Sawyer. And he'll probably mention something about Q process coaching. Yeah, I highly suggest you check him out. And if you are a couple who want to take things to the next level, or you are one side of a couple and you want to bring the other person on, now you have a perspective that can show you how it can work. You could probably hear from asking them both questions, what best worked for her and what best worked from his perspective as well. And that is this episode of the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I am once again your host, Brett Dupree. You can find more information at me at joyousexpansion.com. Also, if you like this podcast, you want to see others, you can say pod.joyousexpansion.com. I believe I'm still on iTunes, as well as Podbeam and other places where podcasts are found. If you like this, leave a comment, subscribe, all those fun things. Any reviews help immensely. If you would like to email me a question, I would love to answer it. I would even do so on my podcast, whatever you want to talk about. You can email me at bre2ts, d-u-p-r-2-e's at joyousexpansion.com. That is Brett Dupree at joyousexpansion.com. I am Brett Dupree, the catalyst of transformation, champion of authentic joy, your joyous expansion life coach, wishing you a life where you can be joy to be love, to be awesome. Now play my jingle. JoyousExpansion.com JoyousExpansion.com Come and say hello to Brett Dupree. He is an inspirational life coach. Good for you and good for me. He turned my life from grey to blue. I'm sure he'll do the same for you. Get in touch and you'll see. Joyousexpansion.com Joyousexpansion.com Yeah